Eric. How you doing today? I'm doing well, David. How about yourself? Hey, I'm doing awesome. And uh, yeah, excited to be here talking about business coaching. If you're new to the show, uh, basically the show is all about either starting a coaching business, leveling up your coaching business, uh, or kind of learning tips and tactics to navigate coaching clients as a business coach. And uh, we're here with Eric Whitmore. And Eric, we are talking about how to start a coaching business in the new year of 2024. So uh, let's start off. I know you got a couple of tips for the audience. What's the first thing that sh somebody should be thinking about if they want to start a coaching business this year? Well, first and foremost, before you uh, <clears throat> before you jump into your coaching business, I would strongly encourage you to determine what's your niche. Mm. Get clear on what it is you want to focus on. And, uh, you know, today uh, things are quite a bit different than they were when uh, even five years ago when I started. Um What's interesting now is we find, uh, you know, a lot of um, de facto business coaches. Yeah, it's like, a, you know, fractional COO, fractional CFO, fractional VP of sales. And so we're seeing more and more of these um, uh, other types of or extensions of the coaching place. And I think that that's actually really valuable. I will tell you that, that uh, when I got started initially, I was a consultant, right? So I called myself a sales consultant. And, uh, you know, I had <clears throat> looked at the other coaching models out there and determined that I didn't really see enough value in what they were offering that I couldn't create for myself when I started my coaching business. And ironically, we joked about this on a previous show a couple of weeks ago and uh, said, well, if you're going to spend $50,000 on a um, on a franchise coaching solution, you might want to save that money. Come talk to us. We'll get you set up and then you'll have like forty thousand dollars to go spend on ad spend <laughs> right yeah um, but uh the, the point of the niche is is that the 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 more defined you are in what your area of expertise is the one it'll be easier to market your business uh two it you'll be able to i think you'll be able to do a better job than i was able to in the early part of, of, of my coaching business clearly defining what it is the end result that you're going to provide for your client because I will tell you from a um, trying to find new clients, one of the biggest challenges is what's what problem are you solving? And when you're like myself, uh, it I, I'm like, I can do anything. I can fix anything. Right. I'm not trying to be arrogant. I'm just I'm very comfortable in many different spaces. So it actually made it challenging for me to say, OK, well, this is who I am and this is what I do. And so I struggled immensely in the beginning with that was really kind of defining, you know, my target audience. Uh, and I would say, uh, you know, and it, this is, again, this is personality based, right? This is how I'm wired. I'm like, I didn't want to turn anybody away. But when I really started honing in on where my niche was, I, I seemed to client uh, to, to work well with, with law firms. And that's, that makes up a bigger portion of my business that I work with now today. Uh, but I didn't know that year one, even year two, I would say, right. And so I started kind of getting clued into it to year three and then year four started coming up with a more specific strategy for that. So um, again, you know that going out, it absolves a lot of the guessing that you do in the beginning, trying to figure out how you're going to find your client base. Because once you know who it is that you want to focus on and what it is you're going to do for them, now your message is clear and you know where to go find your audience. Awesome. So once somebody figures out, okay, I think I think I kind of know what my niche is. What would be the next step? So the next step then is to begin to build your online presence. So uh, again, right, knowing very clearly what your niche is and who you want to go after and who your target audience is. As you do your online presence, start with your website. Then you get into your social media. By the way, if you don't have social media accounts to support your business, uh, that's like not having a website back in two thousand, right? It's it's like a, it's a cardinal sin. Don't do it. Right. You absolutely want to make sure you have a social media platform and uh, your social media uh, presence in place along with. So when you say online, it's all of that. Now, does that mean you're doing TikTok videos and dancing on TikTok? Not necessarily. It just means you do need to have some presence in social media because that's ironically um, a, a big component of, of, of what we teach our clients even is rather than go out and spend because everybody knows about pay per click and, and spending ads on, you know, uh, let's say Facebook or Google or whatever, and to try and generate traffic. Well, in the beginning, unless you have a significant budget, like we joked about, the reality is you probably don't have the extra money to go spend it on ad spend to try and figure yeah. out 
where your clients are, right? Now, Eric, to be clear, the dancing on TikTok has worked well for you, correct? <laughs> I didn't mean, know you were going to try and go there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, not so much. <laughs> Although I did get, I did get a thousand views on one of my TikTok videos. I'm pretty impressed by that. Yeah, see, there you go. <laughs> but um, my, so the, when you when you kind of uh, dial that in, the beauty of having a good social media presence, uh, you know, more than just your friends and family, but some actual people probably looking at your content, right? Now you can actually test a lot of things with your social media platform. And so, for instance, if you have a uh, a marketing message that you want to and you want to do an A/B test, well, in the old days to do an A/B test, you basically got to run a campaign, and let's say you drop a hundred dollars on each one of those. Now, that's a ton of money, two hundred dollars, but you run a hundred dollar campaign on on A and a hundred dollar campaign on B, and see which one converts better. Now you can just do that through social media, right? You. Can do Facebook post, if you got enough people to engage with you on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or whatever it is, you could literally just put a post out there, see how many people respond to it, and you'll recognize which message would land better when you're talking about your offer or some new uh, solution that you want to provide or you know whatever the case may be. But the point is, is that without that social media presence, you lose that opportunity to do that. And it's a cost-effective way to really kind of test your ad spend before you actually spend any money on, on an ad. So certainly a key component of that. But so you have to have that online presence. Um, a couple of key points about online presence for what it's worth. Branding needs to be consistent. This is another mistake that I made early on, right? Um, the color scheme may not always match. The layout did not always match because, you know, how you do stuff for Facebook, those, those layouts, those formats, those pixel sizes or whatever, the different frames, whatever, they don't match what they do in tech there, TikTok and they don't match what you do in in. Uh, Instagram and, and you know, whatever, uh, LinkedIn, right? And so each one of them has their different uh, requirements. So, um, you know, I became a good friend of Canva, uh, learning yeah, right. how to convert yeah. files <clears throat> so that you could uh, do that and build out that presence and then have a consistent look and, and say, okay, so each one of these is, is uh, uh, th you can tell each it's one uniform. of these. Yeah. Uniform, yeah. Uh, and one other thing I'll say about that, David, I think is really relevant as it relates to online presence. When you do do your social media, a lot of people ask, should I have a business account or should I have a personal account or which one should I promote? I would tell you if you have any following on personal and that you, and you don't have a really significant reason to avoid putting stuff on your personal account, you may. I don't know why, but if you did, that there, I wouldn't argue that you have a legitimate reason for it. Uh, but beyond that, I would be promoting my business on my personal accounts. There's uh, and I would have a business account as well, uh, which makes for more posting. And but you don't need to necessarily start with the business account. You just start posting on your personal account, build that, grow that over time. Uh, but I will tell you, I got far more uh, engagement on my personal accounts than I have on any of the business accounts yet. Right. Yeah. And over time, I'm sure that we'll refine that strategy. But uh, the leads that I've generated, the business that we've got, the clients that we've generated from from uh, social media have come from my personal accounts, not my business account. Got it. OK, so pick your niche, right, or determine your niche. Online presence would be the third thing you'd recommend. The next thing is now you have to start your networking um, and your uh, building partnerships. So when I say start your networking, begin to develop who are the people you want to connect with, who's the right person for you to be engaging with. So if you're a fractional COO, you likely want to be partnering with fractional CFOs and fractional VPs of sales and other business coaches of whatever, right? because every one of them, although they do similar work that you do, the reality is they do something different. They go deeper in an area that you don't, or you go deeper in an area that they don't. Yeah. And so assuming I'm, I'm assuming that every professional maintains that level of professionalism that they should, meaning they're not trying to coach something they don't know and don't understand. Right. Then, you know, if, if, for instance, if we're engaging with a client, one of the primary reasons I started my business coaches, I realized, Hey, look, this client actually needs this coaching and I can't provide it because I'm not comfortable in that space. So let me go ahead and introduce them to David because David builds out, training platforms. That's what he does, right? That he makes uh, training content or whatever. So that, that I'm going to introduce them to David, or I'm going to introduce them to 
um, Don, who does taxes, right? And that's his, his big thing is he focuses on taxes. Well, I can give you high level suggestions, but to get real tax advice, I need you to hand, hand you off to Don because that's what he does, right? And so, um, yeah. assuming, but you need those people, those those quivers in your bow, so to speak, when, when, when you're engaging with a client, because often, assuming you have good, uh, impactful conversations, these type of topics come up and you're like, you want to have a solution for that. Uh, yeah, I kind of yeah. I kind of see the role as a, a as a business coach, regardless of what designation you're going to, you know, if you're going to be a, a fractional, whatever, whatever, you know, fractional C-suite of some sort, whatever you end up doing, you're still a coach in the nature of being a coach. Right. And so the biggest thing about being an effective coach is having a solution for all problems, even yeah. if it's not your solution. Right. 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 So if somebody has a challenge and, and it's not something you're comfortable with, you can immediately make that. I've got a guy you need to talk to him. I got a gal you need to talk to her. Right. And so in doing that and providing that as a solution, I think it just makes you more valuable as that as as your as the coach, as the professional that's helping that business do what they need to do. Well, I think what's really unique in that regard on that is with, you know, my best coaches, right? You have a team, a network of coaches. So even within, you know, the same organization, you've got, you know, somebody who specializes in this or that, right? And you can bring in different coaches to leverage that expertise all under one umbrella, which is amazing. And then we talked last week, uh, you've got, you know, a whole bunch of partnerships. So you've got, you know, for payroll and everything else that you just talked about, you've already vetted these people and you know what, um, how, how it can benefit clients. And as a coach, right, new coach, you're trying to build that network. Um, how awesome is it to already have that network built for you and the services you can recommend, right? Absolutely. Because in the beginning, I, mean, I, I actually made this comment for about two and a half years. I told people, I'm like, look, I do as much, I have as many calls with potential vendor partners as I do having calls with actual potential clients. Because I, you know, when I engage with somebody, I want to know that I have those tools and resources and there's a potential revenue stream for it as well. Right. I mean, it's like if I make the introduction to somebody on like ERC tax credits, well, there was a, a, a financial kickback for me to introduce that person. It didn't affect their compensation, how much money they were going to get back. And I got it was the whatever it was factored into the fee that the company was going to charge. And so it, I get a, a an added uh, bonus out of that out of that. Uh, introduction, right? So it makes it benefits me. The company wins. The people, the the client that I introduce them to, they get money back that they were weren't expecting, didn't you know, didn't anticipate. But to your point, we vet those solutions so we don't just go anybody with just what you know. Somebody's going to offer me a few bucks to introduce them to my client. I, it's an extension of my brand name. It's an extension of me, right? So at the end of the day, whoever I introduce them to has got to be somebody who's going to be an upstanding individual. It's going to take care of my client the way that I would otherwise. I'm going to burn a lot of bitches really quick and I won't be a coach for very long. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Worst case scenario, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, you know, building those, those partnerships and then building those networks, uh, you know, of, of solutions and, and um, potential opportunities, right. And start tying those together. I mean, if, you know, depending on, on your client base that you want to focus on another category of client that you could potentially focus on, Right now, today, a uh, quick stat, 49% uh, of all businesses are owned by somebody who's 55 or older. So, and they're retiring. And now the 55, uh, what is it? 55 to 64. Yeah, 55 to 64, I think is like 26%. And then like 23% are 65 and up. So the two numbers combined is 49%. Of, of small business, that's 32 million small businesses and 49%, 48%, whatever the rounded number is, is is of that, call it 50% for all intents and purposes, are owned by somebody who's 55 and older. When you look at it from that perspective, there's a lot of people are looking to get out of those businesses. So what would be a great solution to provide all of those people that are reaching that point where they're looking to, to downsize, maybe unload their business, sell, walk away, create an exit strategy, they might not need to talk to they might need to talk to financial planners. They might they might need to talk to somebody who does business valuations. They might need to talk to a business broker, all of which I have in my network because I built my network to be able to support those individuals and I can make those introductions to my potential clients. To my clients and my potential. Right. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, okay. So I know that that can take some time. So as you're building yeah. your network, right, what else should they be focusing on? 
so beyond step three, the next thing is then begin to build your offers, right? What are my, what are the tools? What are the resources? And how am I going to get those out to people? How am I going to share those with people? So first and foremost, you, you, uh, if you're familiar enough to be a coach, if you're if you're interested in being a coach, you need to understand what a lead magnet is. Most people do, uh, but if you don't, what you, the the a lead magnet is something you provide to somebody to entice them to hear and learn more about what you do. So it could be an ebook, it could be, and it could be an actual masterclass or or um, uh, workshop or something like that. You provide that you provide for free to get people to come listen to you, hear what you have to say, learn more about what you do, how you work, whatever, and then eventually create a relationship so you can scale your business. And one of the biggest opportunities as it relates to, to that is what, what are the things that you can offer, right? So do you have, like we have, we, we have an entry level program we call the Biz Coach Academy, uh, my Biz Coaches Academy. And then in the academy, we have like 300 hours of video content that people can use to review. And, um, you know, you, you're struggling with sales. You just, I don't know, there's like seven or eight different courses on sales. There's a whole bunch on marketing. There's a bunch on websites, not necessarily tactical how to build a website, but strategically how to build a website. Um, you know, so what what kind of messaging should be on there? How, how to create your offer, how to create your market dominating position, all the different things that we reference as a coach. Um, those are all components, but those are that whole course that we created. It's, it's, it's available for free. We drive people to that. And that's that's how we bring people in. We like, take a look at this. Let us know. And they see all the content. And they're like, wow, this is awesome. If they can do all this for free, imagine what their paid content looks like. Right. So yeah. that's how we bring people yeah. through our process. Uh, and then you know, you may have some other uh, solutions. It could be you know master classes or or workshops that you provide. For instance, in the early days when I first started, I used to do a. Um, well, we still do it, but uh, when, the way I got started, one of the ones that I got a good chunk of people from was a uh, goal setting workshop. Right. That, that I do every year. Right. So we did uh, the first time I did a goal setting workshop, I had uh, probably about a dozen people in the room. And out of the dozen people in the room, I would say that for about two or three years after that, about three quarters of the people in that room continued to reach out to me every year to get a refresher on the goal setting. They're also some of the biggest people that bought my books. They're also people that joined my other programs, looked at my other programs. So you have some entry level products and solutions and you have some uh, uh, offers, you know, like I said, ebooks or whatever that you create guides. If you're, if you're really good with that kind of stuff, what a great opportunity. If you're not, you can go into Fiverr and have somebody create that stuff for you, brand it your brand, and then provide that as your solution to, to, to bring people into your, your ecosystem. Uh, and then you have to, and I mentioned it briefly, but you also need your, your specific offer. You know, what is it you do for how much and how much do you give in return for that? Right. So you have to be clear on what your offer is. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. So I'm building my network, I'm building my offer. What would be maybe the last thing that I'd want to focus on? So now you're getting, you should be at this point now generating your first couple of clients, which realistically, if you're out there and you're uh, going to network meetings or you're doing like online networking or whatever, which is the most cost effective way to generate leads. Um, certainly not scalable. I understand that. And I can appreciate that. That'll come over time with your social media components. And, and eventually if you decide that you're either charging enough or you get big enough, or you want to make an investment, then you might do some paid uh, marketing. Uh, but the, the point is, is as you grow and scale, uh, and you start adding more clients, one of the things you need to recognize is you need to have, again, I'll say more quivers in the bow, uh, in, in, you know, in your, in your, uh, container, well, right? In the quiver. There you go. There you go. I think. I think. Um, and because because what happens is your content at some point will become stale, right? Uh, I would say I, I've had a, I've had a client since I started my coaching business. I've had clients that go three months. Uh, you know, th that's the engagement they were looking for. They wanted some help on on a particular topic, and we worked together for three months. The point is, is you you are always going to be looking for new clients. So the more that you continue to educate yourself and develop your skill set, enhance your knowledge and understanding, um, could be people development, it could be leadership development, it could be um, you know get more comfortable in financial uh, understanding of financial 
uh, information terms, reporting, stuff like that, uh, if you don't already have that insight, is going to be valuable because it just makes you that much more valuable as a coach, right? And and I think that that's probably one of the biggest opportunities. I know, you know, we say certifications. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people get wrapped around the axle when somebody says you need to be a certified coach. Uh, yes, there's value in that. And depending on the program, there's way more value some than others. The biggest opportunity that I see is, and, and it's it's a very common challenge, people think they need to be certified to be able to sell something, offer a solution to somebody. At the end of the day, and I've used this analogy, I'm pretty sure I've used it on the show before, but you know, when I became a yellow belt in, in, uh, in uh, Mudaquan, uh, my martial arts style, when I became a yellow belt, the first thing my sensei did is have me start teaching white belt classes. Right. Right. And then when I became a green belt, I was teaching white and yellow belt classes. And I was like, well, this sucks. I'm doing all the work. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. But what they're teaching you is they're teaching you how to ingrain what you know and understand and continue to get better and develop. Right. While you're learning new skills, you're also drilling your, your previous skills and making sure that you're really honing in on those and getting good at those. Well, Similarly, is Go ahead. Oh, I say, and, and there's a big element of that too, of, of you understand it on a much deeper level when you have to teach it, because you, you may do things and you know that they work, but you may not know why they work or why you do it that way. And so when you have to consciously think about, oh, you know, in, in martial arts, you know, oh, that's why, you know, the, the placement of your foot or the angle of your hip matters, right? Because you're generating more power and those sorts of things. But, you know, same thing when you're a coach, explaining the reason behind it helps you understand it that much better. Absolutely. And and uh, perfect for you as the trainer to bring that up, right? <laughs> <laughs> you left the door open now to walk through it. But that's a great point. It's it's when you have a deeper understanding of of any you know like if I have a, uh, a high level uh, understanding of a particular skill set, right? The more that I drill on it, the more I understand, it, the more I understand, it, the more the easier it is for me to train on it. And to your point, get very granular because you will run into people who are going to say, you're telling me to do this, but why? Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, and it's probably going to be me, right? <laughs> It'll be, I'll be that guy, right? Uh, yeah. But yeah, you'll, you'll want to, you want to have a deep understanding of that particular topic. And the deeper you can go on that topic, uh, the more, the more valuable your information becomes. And uh, the more that you'll, I, I, another big piece of this is the more that people will um, hear you speak, recognize and understand that you truly un know and, and understand at a deep level you're, what you're talking about, and then ask you to come speak at other places, which is only going to create more opportunity for you to sell more programs, yeah. right? Or find more clients. So, um, you know, certifications, I think are valuable. Uh, I don't think they're necessary. So if you've got a... Um, uh, what's it, the, the uh, term I want to use, um, you feel like you're not worthy and a certification is going to overcome that. That's that good. That's not the, <laughs> that's, that's not what a certification is for. You want a legitimate certification that's truly teaching you something that is uh, of significant value, a good return that you will provide significant value to your clients. So right. get a certification just for the fact of getting a certification. That's, I guess that's my, uh, little, uh, spiel that I was put out there for my pet peeve, right? People get certifications and I'm like, you're spending money to get a certification and, and you, you know, it's, you put in a certification after your name, what good is that? Right. But if it's really going to support your client base and it's going to help increase the value that you bring to your clients, by all means, you should be making that investment, continue to develop and learn and, and get more in, information to understanding because it'll make you that much better of a yeah. coach over time. Absolutely. Cool. Yep. Mark, a lot of good points, covered a lot of ground. Uh, can you just favor recap the top five things that you would do if you were starting a business, coaching business in 2024? Yeah. If I was starting all over? <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you started all over this year, what would be the top five things you'd focus on? So define my niche, build my online presence, uh, begin to build my networks and my partnerships. And then the, you know, at the same time, what are my offers? And what are the tools and resources I'm going to use as my lead max to generate clients and then continue to reinvest in myself? Awesome. awesome. There's probably a sixth thing that I would do, which is probably check out my best coaches, right? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that plug. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if, yeah. you, if you'd like to shortcut that whole process, 
Uh, we've done a lot of that work for you, and I would strongly encourage you to take a look at if you have any interest or if you already serve uh, business owners in your current space of what you do today. Uh, even if you don't necessarily want to be a business coach per se, but maybe you'd like to increase your earning potential or create an additional revenue stream for what you currently do. So, for instance, let's just say you sold uh, merchant services to business owners. Yep. Well. You're talking to the same people we're talking to. And if you and and my guess is from at least from well, the people that I engage with, because we only engage with top notch people in those categories. But the people I engage with that do merchant services, they're really good at what they do. Yeah. Right. We've been through a handful of them, some but much better than others. And, and for those 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 ones that are really good, what I find is they're not just merchant service salespeople, they're educators. They're consultants. They sit down with their client. And they help them understand why, you know, they're actually they were told they're paying, you know, they're only paying two point two five percent on their credit card. But when they get their credit card statement and they take the percentage of fees and divide it by their revenue, it's more like four percent. Right. Right. And they explain why that is because there's the exchange rates and all these other factors and these nuances that, that you know, somebody like myself, I'm a geek. I want to go figure that stuff out. So I go find those really smart people in that category and I say, help me understand this so I can talk to my clients about it. Yeah. Well, if you're already doing that, you're providing a service and a solution to your client as it is as a merchant service provider. And so my point to you is you're already coaching to some degree. Right. So we believe at my biz coaches, we believe everybody needs a coach. We believe anybody can coach and we only encourage people to stay in their lane, right? Yeah. Don't deviate outside of what you're comfortable with. Um, so if you are one of those people and you are providing that kind of consult consultative sales solution, then we encourage you to consider looking at my biz partner, uh, my biz coaches partnership, where we have a program. We have uh, a number of, we have as many as 76, but they're not in every market. So, uh, but we have a number of different programs that we make available. So even if you don't want to be a coach, but you want to benefit from that, you can actually refer people to my biz coaches uh, and earn revenue from that. So that's a, that's another piece that we're developing, and that'll be uh, rolled out here in the next uh, thirty to forty five days. And we're excited about being able to introduce that program. So every coach will have that same opportunity, but we're also looking at partners that could to play that role as well. Uh, so excited about that, and as we. As we introduce that and make that available to more and more clients, I think what we're going to find is a lot of professionals out there that are providing that kind of solution. And those people may find that coaching is a nice adjunct to what they're currently doing, right? They can yeah. pick a few clients, bring in a few extra thousand dollars a month and supplement their income as well. So right. we believe that that's one of the places we're going to find a number of coaches, a lot of good quality people that are doing something similar and they can complement their, their, what they're providing to their clients. Yeah. No, I love it. Yeah. And, and bringing it back to the, the theme of the episode, right? If you are thinking about starting that coaching business, save yourself the headache, accelerate the process and work with people that have been there. They've done it, you know, had all the struggles and can help you avoid all the pitfalls. And that's really what my biz coaches is all about. So anything else you want to say before we wrap up, Eric? No, that's uh, like I said, I'm just excited about our, our, our pieces that are coming out this year. 2024 is going to be a big year. Uh, so we're excited about how things are coming together and, uh, um, excited about our new channel. I mean, this this focus, uh, the, I should say, the focus of this channel and what we're doing. Uh, we're introducing a lot more with solopreneurs now. So this whole focus of uh, transition into where we're going, I'm excited about what we're doing in 2024. So. Love it. Awesome. And if you are interested in learning more, we're going to have a QR code uh, at the end here. Be sure to scan that and learn more about my best coaches and how to become a coach. So Eric, as always, thanks for the time and insights. We'll talk to you soon. Appreciate it.